Hello and welcome. How are you? Hi, I'm well. How are you? Thanks so much for having us at OpenAQ. I really appreciate no, thank it. Thank you for presenting. Sorry if I uh, miss, um, uh, didn't pronounce your name correctly, <laughs> so you no, can correct me. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, that's perfectly. great. Thank you. <laughs> I that will, is great. Um, share my screen really quick. Okay. Yeah, we are almost on time, so. You can put in full screen, perfect. I will add it. Okay, that's great. Just, we wait until it's uh, just one minute and uh, we can start. Great. Okay, I think uh, we can go now. I live to it. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chisato Calvert. I'm the interim director of OpenAQ. And welcome to uh, the talk today focused on how to explore and access 10 billion open air quality data points from 133 countries. So just to give an overview, um, OpenAQ is a nonprofit organization based in the US. And our goal is to connect communities with open air quality data so that we can collectively fight air inequality. And what we essentially do um, is provide the service where we provide a global air quality data platform, um, open source, and we make it available to the public. And as of now, since its inception in 2015, uh, we've co been collecting data from 133 countries around the globe. And we aim to use the gravity of that data so that we can get diverse stakeholders, including scientists, journalists, software developers, government agency, um, artists, policymakers, those that are really passionate about making a difference um, to create clean air, to really work together to fight air inequality. As a brief outline of the presentation today, I'll be first talking about why open air quality data matters followed by a little bit about the OpenAQ platform, some examples of community use cases, um, and then lastly, um, walking through a brief demo about how to access the data. So why open um, air quality data matters? Um, thinking about data infrastructure as an invisible and foundational infrastructure is really important for solving air pollution. So when you think about skyscrapers in cities, they require foundations, even though they're these tall, um, gigantic um, um, architecture, um, in order to make it effective and to make it, um, um, I guess, ground truthing is to be able to ensure that there's that invisible infrastructure. And the same thing with air, air pollution and air quality data. In order to fight air pollution more effectively, we need to have access to that basic infrastructure, uh, which is data. And the impact really depends on the ability for different stakeholders to be able to access that existing air quality data at various geospatial scales. So for example, when we're understanding health and environmental and economic impacts of air quality, when it comes to creating air pollution focused policies, setting and enforcing these standards, raising awareness and storytelling around air quality and communicating public health actions, all of these impacts are connected to and are really important um, uh, connections to air quality data itself. This is uh, one statistic that we found from a 2020 uh, global state of um, play um, report that we published at OpenAQ. Um, and this showcases that of all the governments around the globe, um, only 50% of those governments actually produce any air quality data, um, which means that 50% of the world um, uh, go world governments do not produce air quality data. So what happens is 1.4 billion people around the globe don't have any access to data or information about the air that they're breathing on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And even further, um, of the half of the world governments where they do produce air quality data, um, here are some snapshots. You know, they have the data available in different websites, um, which means that they're not really accessible unless you know about it. Um, they're also in different formats, which means that you can't necessarily compare um, government um, stations in Buenos Aires, for example, with um, stations in China. Um, and what makes it difficult is that you can't compare these um, different data sources because of the disparate formats. Um, even furthermore, um, because they, the data is st stored in the government websites, that website can go down at any point. And once it goes down and it's not accessible, then people can actually access the data um, about the air quality in their city. Um, to share, um, I guess, a backstory of why I became interested in air quality, um, I've been studying in Mongolia, uh, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, since 2006. And um, air pollution is a huge issue there. Um, it's, a, it's a seasonal issue. Um, it's a topographic issue. It's a political issue. Um, and I think that um, since 2006, there's been a lot of momentum in terms of getting air quality data into the hands of Mongolian citizens. Um, and that gives uh, me hope and it gives OpenAQ hope um, in terms of the types of changes and ripple effects that we could see in countries where if the data, if that foundational infrastructure is made available to the public, uh, citizens um, and, you know, policymakers, people who are uh, clear advocates of air quality can actually make a change on the ground. Now I'm going to shift over to share a little bit about the OpenAQ platform itself. Um, this is an overview of sort of where the OpenAQ platform fits in within the air quality ecosystem. So as I mentioned before, there's air quality data being produced by about 50% of the world's governments around the globe. Um, we connect that data um, to the world by actually creating an open, transparent, you know, accessible um, OpenAQ platform. Um, and that platform is then um, being used by various stakeholders, including media, government policymakers, um, climate change and public health researchers, the private sector, as well as universities and other educational institutions. Here's a snapshot of the OpenAQ platform world map. So you'll see each point um, on the map. These are all the data that we're aggregating um, and we're making accessible open source in one, a one-stop shop, a one, uh, one platform. Um, as of today, uh, we've reached over 10 billion air quality measurements, actually, across the globe, across 396 data sources. And just to clarify, a data source is a data um, managing entity. So, for example, the U.S. EPA would be uh, an example of one source. Um, and we're collecting um, data from 133 countries around the globe. And as of February 2020, um, or sorry, February 2021, we've uh, not only been collecting reference grade government um, data, but we're also collecting low cost sensor data. Um, so that really expands the possibilities of filling in these key data gaps where you see um, in this map currently, uh, we don't have as much coverage in South America. We don't have as much coverage um, in Africa or Australia. Um, as I mentioned, it's an open source platform, um, and that's the beauty of uh, OpenAQ. So this is our GitHub page. Um, anyone can contribute um, to the OpenAQ platform, um, which is really amazing because this means that we can have contributors who are adding sources from um, Bosnia. Um, we have people who are fixing adapters and making sure that the platform is running um, smoothly. Um, all these contributions really help to make uh, the OpenAQ platform what it is. Now I'm going to shift over to talk about a few community impact cases of how the data on the OpenAQ platform is being utilized in different uh, ways. Uh, my first example is in research. So the NASA, the US NASA GMAO team um, has created a real-time um, or I guess near real-time global air quality forecasting platform. 
Um, and this was made, made available uh, primarily because they were able to do evidence checks between the modeling that they were, were creating um, and the, the against the data, uh, the ground monitoring air quality data that's available on OpenAQ. So in terms of the impacts, you know, they were able to compare that key model with the observational air quality data. Um, and the actual platform itself allowed for um, comparisons across the globe, for example, PM 2.5, um, particulate matter PM 2.5 um, concentrations in China uh, versus Mongolia. And this really also helped to identify broader data availability gaps um, in NASA's key priority areas. So it really helped to contribute to uh, NASA's research as well as development of new tools for the public to use. Another research example um, is a study that was conducted by Surat Guritunga at Urban Missions based in, um, in India. And his study really showcased um, the nitrogen dioxide um, concentrations and comparing it against the pre-COVID lockdown and post-COVID lockdown period. And he used this research actually to inform policy at the various state levels in India. Um, and so this is a very clear indication of, you know, what, if the data was not available um, on OpenAQ, where you can actually track historically what the historical data, um, data trends were in a particular place around a particular pollutant like nitrogen dioxide, um, this kind of study wouldn't have been possible. So we're really excited to see that there are scientists who not only want to conduct the study, but also make those connectivities to push for policy at various government levels. Another research study um, is focused on COVID uh, lockdown sort of emissions, um, but rather than looking at one particular city, this is looking at um, COVID concentration, uh, sorry, um, looking at um, air quality concentrations across 34 countries. So this is a more global study um, of how impactful uh, the lockdowns were um, due to the COVID pandemic. In terms of community groundwork, um, we've done, um, all, in addition to providing the OpenAQ platform, we also connect with stakeholders around the globe. So we've conducted workshops um, in different countries. And this is one example of a workshop in Accra, Ghana, where we brought together stakeholders from um, media, from software development, from government, um, those you know, advocates on the ground who are working with low-cost sensor um, data and really collectively brainstorm uh, what the main problem is when it comes to air quality, identify one particular problem, and then also co-create a solution or action related to that. Um, so some key impacts from this engagement that engaged with open data is that they decided that a community statement demanding increased coverage and frequency of air quality monitoring in Ghana uh, is the best uh, foot forward. And this statement was actually picked up by a publication called Clean Air Journal. Um, and a professor um, in Colombia read this uh, journal article in Clean Air Journal, and as a result, donated air quality monitoring equipment to the local network across um, Ghana. And so this is an example of how um, connecting people around open data um, and the action that it spurs can actually have that ripple effect where you have um, an outcome like a donation of air quality monitoring and just having a Kragana more uh, prominently on the map, uh, on the global map when it comes to air quality related work. Um, so this was a really impactful engagement that we were a part of. Um, another community-based um, workshop that we conducted was in uh, Sarajevo, um, Bosnia, where we brought together um, diverse stakeholders once again, and they also wanted to push for a community statement um, demanding air quality emergency action plans. So this was a little bit different in that it was less about the coverage of the data, um, data monitoring network, but rather holding the government accountable um, to make sure that the, the public is being informed about the various thresholds of air quality um, that they are breathing. So they submitted this as a pol uh, policy recommendation and was able to push for uh, emergency thresholds to ensure that there's warnings 
um, once the air quality levels are too high or too hazardous. Um, so this is another example of how we can actually use open data to start a conversation um, and how this bringing together of committed stakeholders can really push for advocacy um, on the ground and make a difference. Um, now I'm going to shift over to talk about um, data access um, on the OpenAQ platform. Um, just before I show my screen for a demo, um, I wanted to show sort of broadly sort of four ways to access the data. Um, one is through the OpenAQ API. Um, the, the bottom left um, is focused on how to use our dashboard um, where um, it's easy, a little bit easier to navigate um, through the website. Um, and another way is through our AWS um, S3, which is our storage bucket um, on the OpenAQ platform. So I'm just going to shift over and um, share my screen here um, so that you can see the full uh, website. Um, so this is our homepage at OpenAQ. Um, and if you go to open data, um, you'll see um, five tabs here. So these are all different ways that we can access the data on the OpenAQ website. Um, I'm first going to click on the world map just because you've already been familiar from the presentation. So this is uh, a live map. So these are all the points that you'll see of uh, OpenAQ's um, aggregated air quality data from across the globe. Um, you'll see here, so the circle means reference grade sensor and the square means a low cost, uh, low cost sensor or air sensor. Um, and here in this box is the, the various gradations with each um, gradation of colors um, associated with uh, the pollution level. So dark blue would mean that it's the cleanest uh, in terms of PM 2.5 concentration. Um, and the highest would be red. So you'll see some red dots here um, when, when it's scaled out like this. And then I also wanted to mention that you can actually pick uh, different parameters. So we collect seven main parameters right now, our pollutants, um, and we collect uh, several others, but these are our main pollutants that we're collecting. So if you click on CO, you'll see that it'll change in terms of the data collection. Um, if you click on PM2. Uh, sorry, PM10, um, this is the data that comes up. So um, we usually, it's on default for PM2.5, just given um, how important it is for public health um, to understand PM2.5 exposures. So this map, you can zoom in um, into particular area, um, just given that um, we're focusing in Buenos Aires. Let's see if we can zoom in. So it seems like for, for Argentina, we don't have as much um, uh, data right now. Um, I think this is um, something that could hopefully change in the future, um, but a lot of the um, the data that's available in South America right now uh, it looks like it's chilly. The gray actually indicates that um, the, the site or the government site may be down, um, and so that's something that um, we try to be mindful about and be able to build partnerships with organizations and governments so that we can actually streamline the data uh, real time as accurately as possible. So this is the map. Um, when you click on a particular uh, uh, when you click on a particular point, you'll see that it will show the location name um, as well as the concentration and the source. So this is a purple air low cost sensor. Um, and you can compare and view location this way. Um, but I think that in terms of the utility of the map, it's better is a better served as um, kind of a broader bird's eye view of um, the data. I think if we want to go in a little bit deeper in interrogating the different data sources, um, sorry, one moment. like there's a little bit of a connectivity issue. Oh, there we go. Um, let's go to the locations page. And the locations page um, will allow you to um, search uh, or filter by different parameters. So one is country. Um, so if you go down to, let's say, because we know Chile had 
a lot of resources or sorry, a lot of um, data points. You can click Chile. Um, and these are all of the data, uh, air quality data, and, and these are different pages available in Chile. Um, each box will have the source, um, the collection dates, uh, what parameters, so if it's which pollutants it'll be collecting. Um, and then these tags are low cost sensor because it's purple air um, community. It's a community uh, based organization that's collecting the data and it's stationary. We do have some mobile air quality data, which is why we have that tag right there. So if you want to view more, you click on view more and it will take you to that particular location um, and it will share how many measurements have been collected during the, the projects period, um, the coordinates, uh, the latest measurements. Um, and there's a technical readme for Purple Air if you'd like to learn more about the source itself. Um, and there's a scatter plot that um, allows you to see the different um, measurements of PM10. If we change it to PM2.5, you'll see the PM2.5 measurements in the scatter plot um, across the different uh, dates and times below. And this is a snapshot of the days of the week and month of the year. So if you're looking more broadly um, at different patterns throughout the year based on different air quality related events, or different seasons um, throughout the year, you can do that. Um, and here you'll have, um, we aggregate the data by averages, so you'll see the average um, and counts of the um, PM 2.5 level here. And here's a map in case you are interested in sort of seeing where the nearest um, PM 2.5 uh, or the nearest government grade sensors or um, uh, low cost sensors are uh, spatially in proximity to the location that you've selected. So that's another way to um, sort of find the data um, by location. Another way you can do is um, through country. Um, and these are all uh, country boxes here. So you would actually just have to scroll to the country that you're looking into. Um, this time, um, let's say we want to focus on Hong Kong. Um, you click on Hong Kong and view more. Um, th this shows that there are 16 locations, uh, this many measurements uh, and one source. So it, it may be a government source, for example. Um, and here is a snapshot of the various um, air quality monitors that are available. It looks like based on this map, in Hong Kong, uh, the data that we've collected is uh, all reference grade sensors. Um, and then you'll see that uh, it's one location um, and you can view more again, kind of like the way that we had done with the locations page. Um, and then lastly, uh, another dashboard way is through the data sets. Um, this is uh, more geared toward um, I guess, uh, project-based um, air quality monitoring networks. And so this is part of um, a project that we were part of with Environmental Defense Fund based in the US where they were collecting mobile and stationary measurements. Um, and so if we wanted, and this is updated seven years ago. So in this sense, this was um, transferred over onto the OpenAQ platform in February. Um, but we wanted to be able to provide historical data um, on OpenAQ. So um, here is a Chicago mobile methane project. Um, so this is a network that was within the project that they were implementing. Um, and so uh, if you click more, um, similarly to the other pages, you'll see that this historical data is available um, and life cycle stage. So they, they analyze their data, which is why we have that life cycle stage pointed there. Um, and because it's a mobile monitoring project, um, you'll see that we'll have the radius here as well as the different um, geographical points where the data was collected. Um, but this historical data is made available um, for anyone who's interested in looking deeper into this particular location using mobile sensors. Um, and then the last way to be able to access the data is actually through our API. Um, so this is for folks who are uh, more interested in the software development side um, and or, or and or interested in accessing data 
in in some ways in a little bit more efficient ways um, because it's not dealing with navigating a dashboard. It's really just putting in particular endpoints. So you'll see here, uh, we're now currently on our version two um, API and each um, uh, endpoint here uh, is related to a particular search parameter that you want to conduct for air quality. So for example, uh, if you want to look into version two measurements um, of air quality, um, you can use this page um, and you can um, uh, get the response and you'll see uh, at the bottom sort of what the search parameter is. Um, you can search by averages, um, there's location, uh, location ID is a little bit different um, from locations in that it's tagged um, based on um, sort of what the source is identifying as the location. Um, you can get the latest um, measurements um, and by country. So all of these search uh, parameters are um, equivalent to what is available through the um, through the dashboard or through the OpenAQ website. Sorry, Chisato, I have to interrupt you because uh, we should leave some time to questions. Sure. Okay, it was a very, very nice presentation, very clear, but uh, you have some questions, so uh, let's go to them. Um, thanks for the presentations and congratulations for the work. The world need, needs it. Did you consider to use the OGC sensor things API standard to serve the AQ data? Can... Yep. So we. Um, so I don't. I don't know. I, I missed the the last part a little bit, but we do have. Um, you can access the the data through the API, um, and I'm happy to share after this um, calls, or I can actually put it in the the chat. Yeah, um, I actually also copied the question oh, in good. our chat, so you can. Oh, awesome! Great. Thank them. You. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks so much for the the question. And yeah, I think API access is the primary way in which um, the community accesses the data. Okay. There are some more questions. Um, for the community data, do you check the data from Sensor Community? Yeah, so we've actually connected with them um, in the past, and I think they're uh, generally interested in sharing their data. Um, so we haven't, um, the last time we connected with them, I think was over in the spring, um, but just given that they are a uh, community-driven organization um, and have low-cost sensor networks um, across Europe and across the world, um, we're definitely interested in being able to integrate their data onto the OpenAQ platform so it's accessible more broadly to those who are interested in a particular region of the world. But thank you, yeah, really appreciate the question. Great. Another question is, how do you deal with fails, false data reports about air quality in some countries? Yeah, it's a good question. So our goal, because our goal is to be able to provide open source uh, and we are, we're providing raw data, um, we actually can't, um, Kind of um, at this point, we haven't done any QA, QC data, and so when there's false reporting, uh, what happens is the value becomes like nine 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 nine. It's it's very clear when uh, a value is um, you know false in the sense that the uh, reference grade monitor is down um, or something. If there's a bug or something like that, but it is because we are an open source platform, it really is on the user to be able to differentiate that. So. Um, we could probably communicate that uh, more broadly, but we don't have, um, because we're either, um, uh, the, the government is providing the data or we're, uh, we're pulling the data, um, we have no, I guess, control in terms of what the data is that shows up on the, the, the website or on the API. Okay, another question is, how does OpenAQ make the reference and low cost sensor readings consistent? So we have a um, OpenAQ data um, I can share. Um, we have a format. Um, so we request that any data coming in actually uh, follows this format, regardless of whether it is uh, reference grade or low cost sensor. Um, so this standardized format really helps to ensure that there's consistency. Um, and then also, um, we also collect a lot of metadata 
on both reference grade and low cost sensor, but particularly low cost sensor, so that there's more context around um, the data that people would be accessing um, through the OpenAQ platform. Great. Uh, let me check if I think there is one more question. Are the uh, API following the OGC sensor things APA? Sorry, I will copy in the chat. <laughs> Many acronyms. Um, you know, I'm actually I, I haven't I haven't heard of the OGC sensor things API. Um, the everything on our system um, is actually run through AWS, um, and so um, all the protocols and sort of the um, the coding that we're doing is through that. Um, but we'll definitely look into this um, as well. Okay, um, I think we have covered all of the answers, all of the questions, sorry. Uh, it was a very, very nice talk. Uh, thank you very much. We Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for everyone who's tuned in and definitely um, visit our site at www.openaq.org. Um, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Great. See you.